Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to Motor One This Week, the weekly podcast for Motor One. I'm here today with writer Christopher Smith. How are you doing, Chris? I'm very good, John. How about you? I'm very good. Yeah, you know, trying to survive the coronavirus and winter at the same time. Uh, other than that, I'm doing pretty well. I have faith in you. <laughs> As I do you. <laughs> uh, but we have some good stories to get into this week, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we were pretty excited to see these spy shots that came across our desk the other day. Yes. Why don't you tell us about them? You know, there's a little vehicle in the United States called the Ford F-150 that I'm told is kind of a good seller. Maybe it's been the best-selling vehicle for decades. You know, a little bit of understatement there. We got our first look at the new F-150's front end. Ford has been running around some prototypes with absolutely no coverings over the headlights, grill. They don't even have their blue oval covered up. And so many times we see prototypes, they at least cover up the uh, the badge so you don't know exactly what vehicle it is. It's almost like Ford is intentionally parading these around with some camo, maybe to try to just drum up a little bit of excitement. And uh, yeah, we have our first look at the front end at the restyled truck. You know, th there are different grill styles that we've seen so far. We've seen a hybrid. We've seen, uh, I think, just what looks like would be the regular XLT. Um, but there's, it, it, I'll be honest, if I'm Ford, I might be a little nervous right now. Because when we first saw these shots, John, and I think we were talking about it uh, in our chat a little bit, um, the double stacked headlight combination Sure looks a lot like GMC and uh, Chevrolet back from like around, uh, not not the, the last generation, but I think the generation before that. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, I, I would say this front end that these prototypes are showing, it's definitely clean and new looking, but it's very conservative. And I, yeah, the, I, I, the stacked headlights do look reminiscent of some other full size trucks uh, from a generation or two ago. I would say everything looks handsome. It looks it looks good. There's nothing to complain about. There's nothing that's over the top, but very conservative at a time when GM has gone kind of wild with their truck designs. Uh, you know, the Chevy Silverado has those blades on the side and is very kind of hard edged. Um, the Ram is just so good looking. I mean, the Ram to me is the is the the best designed one of the bunch. So I think when you're Ford and you sell as much as your competitors combined with the F-150 nearly, conservative is okay. You really just want to avoid screwing it up. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to do something shocking to gain market share. You have all the market share. So, and honestly, this is, so we've seen two grills so far, like you said, probably an XLT and definitely a hybrid grill. There's probably like five more grills uh, that they're going to, going to have when they launch this thing. There's so many trim levels of the F-150, so many different looks. Um, but overall, I think it looks, I think it does the job it needs to do. It stays handsome. It looks newer, um, but it doesn't risk anything. Well, see, I, I mean, it's, you're right. It is extremely conservative. It's not going to rock any boats. It's clean. I'm not sure that it's handsome. And by that, I mean, I mean, I hold like you, the new Ram, that's just set. I think that has set a new bar for just how handsome and attractive a full size pickup truck can look. I'm not sure I feel the new F-150 here is handsome, but it's certainly clean. And I, I certainly see a lot of, well, maybe a little bit of Ram influence almost in the grill. And the I design. agree. I see that. that too. I, yeah. I mean, that was my first reaction. And I put out some feelers just with some of my Ford friends, and it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, is Ford not going to sell new F-150s because of the styling? No, it's still going to sell well. Um, will it sell as well as they like? You know, it's hard to say. Well, when you look I at our... it, it, the question is, will it continue to fend off the Ram? Like, will, will Ram be gaining sales at GM's expense or will it start taking Ford sales? That's the question. I don't think it, Ford is going to lose its number one place to the Ram, but the Ram is continuing to climb in sales. And the question is, who is it stealing, stealing sales from? It really is climbing in sales. I think uh, I think Ford F-150 sales were just about flat for 2019. Yeah. I'm just going by memory. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Ram sales were way up. I think uh, Silverado or, or well GM sales combined, I think were, they were either flat or down a little bit. So, I mean, Ram is certainly charging. And I tell you what, 
when you look at the comment section for our first um, F-150 Spy Shot series, there's like 49, 50 comments. Yeah. The very, the very first comment is like, is that a GMC? And there are a <laughs> lot of commenters going down through there saying, wow, you know, not really sure what Ford is doing here. This looks a lot like, a, you know, a GMC product or a Ram product. So it's, it's conservative. So I think I think it might open the door a little bit here. I mean, maybe it's a little too conservative. It might open the door a little bit for Ram to to uh, to take some market share. So you and I have also seen uh, spy shots of the new F one fifties interior, um, and we haven't published them. So none of the readers or listeners out there um, can look at what we're describing. But what it did show was a very large. Uh, infotainment screen uh, and rather than like in the RAM where the giant infotainment screen is vertical this one was more horizontal um, but it was impressively large and I gotta say um, I'm uh, driving around right now in a GMC heavy-duty pickup um, and the infotainment screen on screen on it is like seven inches it is just drowning in the size of the dash and I think Ford may have a really nice um, technical case to make for itself with the, the tech features it's going to have in the new F-150. Because keep in mind, it's the last of the big three to be fully redesigned uh, and have a new model out. Uh, and not fully, re- this is more of a refresh, but it's going to get a full implement of the latest tech, the latest features. And so it's going to have the freshest stuff on the market for the next couple years because I don't think we're getting any refreshes or new models in the full-size truck segment in 2021. Um, so, you know, I mean, the, this interior from from the bits and pieces we've seen in Spy Shots are going to, you know, blow the GM ones out of the water. Um, the Ram has a great interior, so I think at the very least, the the F one hundred and fifty it looks like it will come up to meet the Ram. And depending on what it ends up being when they debut it, I mean, it could exceed the Ram too. So maybe that's the ace in the hole for Ford. Is they're gonna, you know, be conservative with the design, but pack in as much technology as possible. Um, it's I I have to believe that because again, this is their best selling vehicle. They spare no expense on the development of this thing. Yeah, I'm not concerned about the interior. And to be honest, I mean, I'm not really concerned about the exterior because it is a very conservative um, update. And that's a, also a good point to make. Um, from our understanding, I mean, the bones underneath are still going to be the same. This really is more of a refresh as opposed to something all new from the ground up. And I think um, I think this refresh is only supposed to be around for just like a few years um, with an all new I mean, like from the ground up F-150, I think around 2025, 2026, those, those are, those are unofficial numbers, of course, but I mean, yeah, Ford's playing it safe here. I can't believe we're talking about 2025. That makes me feel I so know, old. right? It's like none of these cars are flying. I used to think 2005 was like so far in the future that it would <laughs> never happen. And here we are in 2020. We are totally not that old. Let's uh, let's let's move on to uh, one of the most popular articles uh, that we wrote last week, uh, and this one's about the 2020 Honda Civic Type R. Uh, Honda had a, a debut for the 2020 Civic Type R in Europe uh, for a particular reason. They debuted a new version of the Type R called the Sportline, and it's a pretty amazing version. They basically toned down all the the boy racer, fast and furious edges of the Type R. Uh, they take out the the really obnoxious giant rear wing, and they put a much more appropriately sized one. On the car, um, they also add a little bit more sound deadening, and basically, you know, make the car a little bit more mature and less like a like an like a hot hatch on boil all the time. Nothing changes um, in terms of the engine and the power, but this would be the Type R that I go after. I'm not really a big fan of of um, the current one's design and how ostentatious it is. I, I fully recognize how great a car it is in terms of handling. Um, and kind of the the bang for the buck quotient. But I would much rather see this more staid version. Problem is, it's not coming to the U.S. It's for Europe only, which stinks. And uh, you know, we asked Honda why uh, it wouldn't be coming to the U.S., and they just said that the audience for the Type R in the U.S. is young, and they like that stuff. They like the big wing. They like the way it uh, how loud it is. They like all that stuff, so they're not going to bring this one over. I think that's a big mistake. I think they would sell uh, more Type R's overall 
if they had uh, this example as well as the you know regular Type R? Well, I mean, I don't know if it's a, if it's a big mistake. I can kind of see where Honda is at um, with regards to just going big. I I don't see any reason why they don't bring it over. Just because honestly, I, to me, it's not that big of a change. Uh, I mean, you look at the Type R, the Sport line. It's it's still pretty ostentatious. I mean, it still is very very busy. Yeah, a lot of vents, a lot of vents up front, a lot of vents, a lot of just angles and lines and action going on. The wing at the back, I mean, it looks a, it looks smoother and a bit more handsome from the back, but it's a Type R. It's it it should be loud and and kind of ridiculous. And I I dig the loud and ridiculous. I I don't think I would go for the sport line. I'd go for the uh, I'd go for the regular Type R with a big wing. And and uh, we should also clarify. There is a new wing on the back for the sport line that's smaller, but it's still a pretty big freaking wing. I mean, it's not Yeah, it's not it's, it's a, not like it just disappears. It's, it's no wallflower. It's, it's still a bit It's yeah. still a, it's still a wing that <laughs> you're not going to miss it. It's um, it's it's still a big wing. I think know, I'd, I'd 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 go for the type I'd go for the regular type R, the the limited edition one that uh, that I know you're going to touch on. I I kind of dig that with the yellow. So yeah, let's talk about that for a second because I think yeah. this was the a little bit more exciting to me uh, of what they debuted. So they also debuted a Type R limited edition, which sounds kind of like a cliche name uh, for a car, but it's actually more significant than that because the Type R. The regular Type R used to hold the front-wheel drive lap record on the Nurburgring, and it lost that last year, I think, to the Renault Megane RS Trophy Dash R, which is a mouthful. Um, and that set a lap record of seven minutes and forty seconds. And uh, it turns out Honda really didn't want to lose that record, so they're making this uh, limited edition version of the Type R. And it's basically built to take that record back, and that's it. So. There's a lot of weight reduction, uh, uh, especially in the wheels. They're using new uh, BBS forged aluminum wheels uh, that save 18 pounds. And in the in the rolling mass, that's, that makes a huge difference. They took out sound deadening um, and a bunch of other things uh, like rear heater, heater ducts to save uh, 28 more pounds. Um, and then the European spec versions also lose their infotainment system, system and air conditioning. Um, however... This will be sold in the U.S., and you can keep those items if you want, because we know we, you know, American citizens like to be pampered. Um, so we don't, we don't want to lose the air conditioning. Um, so for the U.S., we'll get 600 copies of this thing, and it will only come in one color, uh, which is a yellow. And what's the name of it? I had it written down here. It's like a phoenix yellow, I think it was called, uh, and it really yeah, looks like so. it really looks like um, the Acura Integra Type R yellow uh, for back in the day. It's very similar yes. to that. Um, it, it it reminds me a lot of that. Uh, of course, the uh, the old Integra Type R wasn't nearly as busy visually as this, but, <laughs> nor as powerful. <laughs> <laughs> not as not as powerful, but uh, I yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. That's the one I would have over the sport. Yeah, so it is. Um, it, oh, it's also going to get um, Pilot Sport Cup Two tires, which will probably make as much a difference as anything um, in terms of of how it handles and how fast it can go around the Nurburgring. They haven't said when they are going to uh, make an attempt, but I'm sure it's in the works and will happen soon. Um, we don't know how much it'll cost either, and considering a standard Type R starts at forty thousand dollars, this one is probably going to be significantly higher than that um but i love it i love that honda is playing with the car bringing more versions um that they're taking you know this lap seriously that that's a real commitment to performance that you don't always see uh from automakers and you i mean we know honda they're engineers before they're anything else so mm -hmm. i have no doubt they can get that uh that record back Really? Because I'm, I get the impression that maybe they're a little nervous, that maybe they're a little hesitant to go over there and pull the trigger, um, that they're not entirely sure they can do it. I don't think they would have announced it if they weren't sure. I think it's, it's, it's you know, automakers are probably, especially ones like Honda, I, I doubt they take risks like that. They take calculated risks. I think they are 
are confident uh, they can get it back. Uh, otherwise, now that said, maybe you're right because they called it the limited edition. They didn't call it the Nurburgring edition. They didn't, right. you know, <laughs> they didn't do it and then come out with it. They came out with it and are hoping they can do it. So well, uh, and and they haven't listed us. Uh, they haven't, unless I'm mistaken, they haven't given us a time when they're going to go over there to give no, us they a haven't. shot. They haven't. So. I don't know. Maybe I'm just reading between the lines too much. I get the impression that, oh, we are intending to go and bring the front-wheel drive Nürburgring record back to Honda. But this is the limited edition, and we don't have a specific time that we're going to go over to the Nürburgring just yet. And this and that. I just Maybe I'm reading between the lines, but it seems like maybe they're not entirely confident that the car can do it. And... Honda, if you can't do it, it's not a big deal. Nurburgring records, for me personally, it's more about the driver than the car because the track is so long. There are so many corners. There are so many different ways to go through there. You can switch the driver. I mean, like good qualified drivers and gain or lose 10 seconds. Yeah, but usually when these automakers are going after Nurburgring attempts, they are using drivers who know the track like the back of their hand. You know, people who've who've, uh, had decades of experience on it. Um, this is, I mean, I, I hope somebody, uh, makes a movie about the Nürburgring, like they've made one about, uh, you know, Ford versus Ferrari. It, these unofficial records are so fascinating to me that these automakers can go out and do it. And there's no governing body that times the laps. You know, the automaker just comes out and says, we did it in this time. And everybody believes them. And, and, you know, they provide proof, you know, uh, you know, they always have a video that comes out later, but. Uh, it's so fascinating how important it is um, to these automakers to set these lap records. Um, and a few of them are just locked in heated battle. Like Porsche participates. Um, oh, yeah. Corvette has. Um, a lot of you know smaller manufacturers go after it because it's good marketing. It's something to hang your hat on and make waves. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's straight up bragging rights. It's right. like who has the biggest touchscreen. It's, I mean, it's just it's straight up bragging rights. It doesn't necessarily make the car better. But uh, it it makes the uh, it it makes the enthusiast say, "Hey, I want to have that car because it is three seconds quicker around a thirteen mile course, right? With with this driver behind the wheel and these tires. And uh, I, if they well, don't do it, I just hope Honda doesn't create its own little category like we've seen other automakers do. Well, the Civic Type R is the fastest yellow hatchback right. front wheel <laughs> drive. Start qualifying you know, it. No, yeah. don't do that." Right, exactly. I mean, I, to, to me, the Nurburgring lap record is something like um, being able to brag you have the highest towing capacity for trucks. You know, it's yeah. like it's fairly meaningless, but man, do they go after it? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, because of the marketing value of it and the bragging rights that, that your buyers can uh, hang their hat on. Mm-hmm. So we'd love to hear what you think about the Type R. Um, do you like these new additions? Which one would you take? Um, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and shout at us. Let us know. Uh, we are at MotorOne.com on both of those platforms. And, of course, you can find us on the Motor One website itself. Just leave a comment, um, call us out, and we'll find it and answer you. We'd love to. Um, I, w- I do want to remind everybody that you can get our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can subscribe to us and get our new episodes every week. All right, we're back. And speaking of performance cars, I want to talk about a story from last week that really got read by a lot of people on Motor One. And I was a little surprised because there wasn't tons of information to go on. But it was news that the next generation Subaru WRX STI is going to get a 400 400 horsepower version of Subaru's 2.5 liter turbo uh, four cylinder boxer engine. Now, the current STI uses the well-known, been around forever, 2.5 liter turbo um, that Subaru uses in um, a lot of its cars. They use the, the, I think, the naturally aspirated version in a lot. This engine architecture goes back to the 90s, very tried and true. Um, but the horsepower that they're getting out of that right now is like in the low 300s. And I think in the S209 version of the STI, which is the current like super limited edition from Japan version, it's like 340 something. 
Um, so to jump to 400 is a big jump. And of course, we're even doing it with a little less displacement in a 2.4 liter rather than a 2.5. However, I, this this 2.4 liter is turbo is kind of the future for Subaru because it's already being used in the Subaru Ascent, which is a you know big, heavy three row SUV. It's lugging that around um, as well as the turbo uh, turbo models of the Legacy and the Outback. So if you get anything, any trim level up to the highest trim level on the, on the Legacy and Outback, you're getting the 2.5 liter. Um, if you get the highest level, the turbo trim level, you're getting the two point, the new 2.4 liter, liter turbo that will be shared, that is rumored to be shared with the next generation WRX X, STI. Um, so so that's in, I think the most interesting part is the, the horsepower jump. It's not surprising to me that they're going to use this engine that they've found a home uh, in other Subaru models because, of course, you save money when you use the same part or component as many times as possible. So the, the this is just the the extension of the 2.4 turbo across the Subaru lineup. It's that jump though from you know three low 300s, mid 300s to 400 that is going to make the WRX STI a monster sports sedan. I mean, coupled with all-wheel drive, this thing is going to be an absolute beast. I think that's what people are most excited about. Well, I mean, here's a question I'll ask you, John. Do you think it's too much for the uh, for the STI or, or, or just the, jump, the WRX in general? Do you think it's too much? I don't. I mean, there's, we've been living in a horsepower war in most vehicle segments for, you know, the past five or ten years. And I would say that, you know, the STI, it kind of, you know, the, the Evo is, is no more. Um, but those two always kept it pretty reasonable um, for various reasons. I mean, you know, they were based on rally cars. So I think in many years past, you know, they kind of kept to um, uh, rules for their classes in that regard. I think, you know, back in the day, there even used to be a gentleman's agreement among Japanese manufacturers to keep horsepower at a certain level. Um, so, I mean, look, you and I see cars all the time when you look at BMW M models and AMGs that are pumping out ridiculous horsepower. I mean, the the, the AMG A class is a 416 horsepower out of a, I think a two liter um, turbocharged four cylinder. So, but, but you know, but you know what's interesting right there? You were just talking about high end German cars with the Subaru. I did well, and, that, and, <laughs> and, and that's huh? not, and and that's why I'm I'm saying you know is is it too much? Should Subaru be trying to step up to compete with the likes of, of AMG with their high output four cylinders? Uh, I mean the the STI. I mean it's not it's not cheap, but it's also not necessarily in that completely next level of a, of pricing structure. And I think that's still appealing for a lot of people. It is. And and let's be honest, you could go right now and buy a brand new STI or just a brand new WRX, and go to any one of like five hundred thousand aftermarket tuners and have your 400 horsepower instantly that's I mean, true it, it, it it feels like subaru is maybe just trying to step into that realm that's already occupied if by, they uh, by by even its own by even its own uh you know its own um factory backed uh upgrades you know if they are if they are attempting to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe, you know with the mercedes amg uh a45 or the CLA 45, if they are trying to go toe to toe with those uh, German cars, they really need to have a more polished setup. Um, because when you get in a WRX STI, there is no illusion that you are getting into what is basically a $25,000 economy car that has been turned into a rally monster. Uh, whereas you get into those Mercedes uh, and, and BMWs and you're getting into a luxury car, right? I mean, oh, you, yeah. you're, you're definitely getting what you paid for in that regard. And I think um, it's not going to be enough to just meet those Germans on a horsepower level. I think they need to be met on kind of a refinement a feature and um, uh, level as well. And Subaru hasn't really, certainly hasn't done that with the WRX uh, and the, you know, because it's based on the Impreza. Um, so, but look, it's all a trade off. If they come in ten to fifteen thousand dollars under the Mercedes AMG A45 or CLA45, then there's justification for why you have a cheaper interior. But if you know the bump to four hundred also comes with a big price bump, then 
then I think they have a problem. The Subaru brand has been amazing to watch over really the last over 10 years. I mean, I remember watching the sales of all manufacturers very closely through the the big recession uh, oh, so do I. after 2008. I know where you're going with this. Subaru was month over month sales growth through the recession like clockwork. It was one of the only brands to do that. And they weathered it like a champ. They kept growing afterwards. And it's Mm -hmm. been so impressive. And what I love is, of course, they've been doing it on the backs of their, uh, well, I want to say SUVs, but it's really not just SUVs for Subaru because while the Forester is an SUV, the Outback is more of like a lifted wagon. Um, the Subaru Crosstrek is like a lifted hatchback. So, but it's it's been a it's been riding the wave, the SUV craze, perfectly, right? Mm-hmm. And what I love is that they still have the WRX, the WRX STI. I love that they have the BRZ. Um, these aren't big sellers. But I feel like they still do a lot of important work for the brand um, and and maybe even for the company itself. Like maybe it helps uh, a lot of the designers and engineers and product planners that they're not just um, pumping out these cookie cutter mass produced vehicles, but mm-hmm. they're also really putting work into um, specialty vehicles, fun vehicles. Um, I always love looking at an automaker and zeroing in on the the vehicle they make that I think was the most fun for them to do. I look at Ford and I zero in on the Raptor. The Raptor tells me that that there are lots of people at Ford having a good time. And the, the WRX and the BRZ tell me that about Subaru. Yeah, you know, and, and it all kind of boils down to my stance where Subaru has this good thing going and the STI is certainly a part of that. And I, I think a lot of Subaru buyers, you know, the STI, the WRX buyers especially, they may not necessarily want to have that upscale feel in their yeah, car. Yeah, it might be part of so, the car's identity and like part of the whole experience. So, I mean, it's I mean, it's very interesting rumors. I mean, and, and it's just a rumor right now. But uh, it, with the horsepower war that we currently live in, it, it's certainly an applicable rumor. Um, you know, change is... Change is a major aspect of the auto industry right now. Huge. Yeah, bigger and, than and it's ever been, I think. 400 horsepower sounds totally within the realm of possibility. Um, it sounds, uh, honestly, right on target. So it's a rumor, but it sounds extremely plausible. Right. And, and you know, speaking of change, let me uh, let me talk a little bit about Mazda, because we're talking about how, how big of a deal change is right now. One thing that won't be changing is Mazda for the next couple years thereabouts we yeah. uh we had a re- we had a report last week that mazda as far as we can tell doesn't really have anything in the works for at least the next couple of years no major yeah, it's a redesigns yeah no major redesigns no new models in the lineup and you know it it's very interesting because unless i'm missing something obscure mazda has absolutely nothing electrified no hybrids nope um certainly no evs and this is at a time when hybrid and EV power is really stepping up. They're kind of putting their money down on their on their Skyactiv diesel, I think, uh, for at least the near term. And uh, at, at least, I mean, we have the CX-30, which is fairly recent. Um, we've got and the, the CX-30 the Mazda 3. Is, is the right vehicle at the right time. Like, it's a, yep. it's a new SUV. It slots in between uh, a couple other other SUVs, the CX-5 and the CX-30. Um, and it's been getting a lot of praise, but that's the thing with Mazda. All of their vehicles get pr- critical praise, but they don't get sales. And some of it has to do with the fact that there's a limit on how much Mazda can sell in general. Like it's not, they can't mm-hmm. be afford overnight. They don't have the dealer network to sell that many. They don't have the production capacity to build that many. But uh, I look at their sales every month for the last decade as well. And unlike Subaru, which is a small manufacturer that is diligently and slowly growing and growing and growing, but just doing it constantly, Mazda just cannot seem to, I don't know, find uh, find a lane that leads to kind of permanent and sustained growth, despite the fact that it gets so much critical praise. It's bewildering. Mm-hmm. No, well, you know, I talked to a Mazda dealership, uh, you know, some sales reps, what was it, probably a year or two ago. And they were talking about how Mazda's, and, and I agree with them. There seems like they're positioning themselves has like 
an upscale Japanese automaker. They're a step above Toyota and uh, and Honda in in that respect, but they're not like to the level of full on luxury like you might get with Lexus or Infinity. And it seems kind of an accurate description because you're right. They're they seem to be in kind of this middle ground where okay, is it? Are we appealing to buyers that are going to go Lexus or Infinity, or are we appealing to buyers that want something a little bit more inexpensive? It, it, it seems like they just don't really have um, a, a firm footing as to where they want to be. Yeah, and 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 maybe they're trying to make their own road, and I think the. the I don't think there's a road there, you know? I can give you an anecdotal example of this. Uh, one of our colleagues has a friend who is currently driving, I think, a BMW X3. And she was test driving vehicles to replace that car. And she really liked the Mazda CX-30 and was asking us about it. And we were telling her, yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, giving her you know, the critical praise that ma- many Mazda vehicles get from the press like us. And um, just yesterday, I asked uh, our colleague about uh, this friend, and he said, yep, she got a BMW X2, you know? And it's like, the Mazdas make everybody's shortlist, but it doesn't seem like they ever close the deal. Um, or mm-hmm. they, d- they don't as often as the others. And, and I, I don't know, I don't know why. I, they definitely are aiming for that slot above a mainstream manufacturer but below a, lo- a full-on luxury manufacturer and the and the products deserve the praise they get but i don't know i don't well, know I, I i think at the end of the day i, I mean the, the mazda offerings aren't terribly expensive but i think at the end of the day when you cross shopping between say you know the the cx30 and the bmw you were just describing mm-hmm. I think more often than not, people are just going to step up a little bit more and get that BMW because right. because if, if for no other reason, it's BMW. You're right. It's the not name. Mazda. I mean, it might be a marketing uh, disparity between um, Mazda and the vehicles that they uh, are being cross shopped against. You know, because mm-hmm. it just doesn't have that that brand cachet. It doesn't have um, the recognition uh, or the the reputation. Um, yeah, it, it's a shame because we just rave about Mazdas all the time. We currently have a uh, Motor One has a Mazda three hatchback as a long term vehicle, and mm-hmm. it's amazing. It's gorgeous. It's in like this dark Nardo gray color with black wheels. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, and it, it well, I've, feels like I've, it's, I've, I've, I've I've got a Mazda sitting in the garage. I mean, you don't. That's have true. To, yeah, I don't have to. Me. I don't have to sell you um, on it. I, I will say I did drive the new Mazda three um, last year, and. You're right. It looks great, but I was just not happy with the interior. It's just way too claustrophobic. the The visibility um, is a step well, back, and I and I wonder if if people are are sensing a little bit of that, um, you know, maybe a little bit of let down there. I think I think that is a fair criticism of many Mazdas. Is that yep? Is that compared to their competition, they are less useful, less practical. They usually have less cargo space, you know, less interior space. Um, and I think that's Mazda making a deliberate choice to put form a little bit ahead of function. Um, and that's a choice every automaker makes or tries to tries to balance those forces a little bit. But I think Mazda leans more toward let's make it gorgeous. And if that means a couple fewer, um, um, you know, it, you know, cubic feet of volume or 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 leg room or something like that, they accept that. Um, mm. But when you're driving two cars, you know, back to back when you're car shopping, it's noticeable. Like, you know, you're like, oh, wow, I can't fit my stroller in the back of this thing or, or my dogs Super aren't going to fit. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe this downtime is a good opportunity for Mazda to rethink, <laughs> to, to rethink a little bit. Um, I mean, there are rumors that uh, the RX-7 could come back, possibly not with any rotary. The rotary rumors keep popping up uh, and Mazda they has always continually will. quashed them. But, the you know, they, the... The RX-7 could come back with a, an inline six. Um, there's a full size sedan that uh, that could be here in the works. So we'll see what the next couple of years. Yeah, do. but it's crazy that it's going to be quiet. I mean, it's not going to do them any favors in the next two years for sales. That's for sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's show. You can follow Chris Smith on Twitter at ch writing. You can follow me at john underscore m underscore neff. Uh, Chris, I want to thank you for being on the show with me this week. 
Pleasure as always, John. All right, and thanks everyone out there for listening. We'll catch you next week. <laughs>